Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this online ministry from the Mavadi Reform Street Church. Special welcome to all members of the Mavadi Reform Street congregation and to all others who are listening in this evening. And may the Lord bless us and encourage us and strengthen us and challenge us as we read his word, as we sing his word, and as his word is proclaimed uh, this evening. And we're beginning by singing praise to the Lord from the words of Psalm number 95. Psalm number 95 is the first six stanzas, and it begins, O come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise, with joyful shouts let us the rock of our salvation praise. To meet him with our thanks, let us approach before his face, with joyful shouts let us to him bring now our psalms of praise. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to approach the Lord with thanksgiving and bring to him our psalms of praise. So let's join together then in singing the words of this inspired song of praise in devotion to the Lord our God. Now let us join together in prayer. Lord God, how amazing it is that sinful, imperfect people such as we are, people who sin against you every day, people who sin against you in uh, what we think, in what we say, in what we do, and in what we fail to do, how wonderful a thing it is that people such as we are can, as the psalmist says, approach you and draw near to you to worship you. We thank you that this is possible not because of anything we have done or not because of anything in ourselves for we are totally without merit. We thank you this is gloriously possible in and through what Jesus Christ has done for lost and needy sinners. We praise you for Jesus who opened up for us a new and living way through his shed blood. We praise you for him who lived a perfect life of obedience to your will. We praise you for him who died an atoning death on Calvary's cross. We praise you for him who rose victorious from the grave on the third day. 
We praise you for him who is our, our reigning, our reigning Lord and King. Lord God, by your Spirit, help each one of us here this evening uh, to offer unto you the, the praise and the glory that is due to your great and worthy name. We pray, Lord, that you'll draw us specially near to any who are unwell this evening. We thank particularly, Lord, of those who may be in hospital or have loved ones in hospital suffering with this terrible virus. We pray, Lord God, that you will bless the efforts of the medical staff to bring them healing, and that you will lay your healing hand upon them. And we do ask, Lord, that it will not be very long until a vaccine or a cure can be developed against this virus, and we can once again go about our work and about our business without the fear of this virus. We do praise and thank you, O Lord. We know that it is in you we live and move and have our being. And we pray that we may have that sense of peace that comes from you as we trust in you day by day. So help us now, O Lord God, by your Spirit, to offer unto you the praise that is due to your great and worthy name. In Jesus' name we ask it, and for his glory. Amen. And our readings this evening, uh, first of all, our reading from the book of Isaiah, book of Isaiah, and it's chapter uh, 59, chapter 59. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Isaiah chapter 59, reading 1 to 8. Let's hear the word of God. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongues mutter wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speak lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. And now turning to the New Testament and to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. And we're reading from chapter 4 of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. So reading from God's word as we have it in Ephesians chapter 4. And reading from verse 17 down as far as verse 24. Let's again hear what the Word of God is saying. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, and separated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. Put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. So we end the reading there at verse 24, in God's own infallible, utterly reliable word of truth. 
Please keep your Bibles open, your Bible uh, before you. Please keep it open at this passage in Ephesians 4, where particularly we'll be looking this evening at that little phrase that's found in the middle of verse 18. The phrase which says, of the unbelieving world, that they were separated from the life of God. Separated from the life of God. The worst separation of all. We sometimes say, don't we, that parting is such sweet sorrow. Parting is such sweet sorrow. But very often there's nothing sweet at all about the experience of parting or the experience of separation. It can be, in fact, a very, very difficult thing to deal with. And having to endure various kinds of separation is surely one of the hardest aspects of this current corona virus pandemic. Family members have been separated from one another. I just read uh, last evening about a worker with Mission Aviation Fellowship who was separated from her family for over a month because she couldn't get back home after the outbreak of the virus pandemic. And there are many others who have been in a similar situation. Grandparents have been separated from their grandchildren. Even the closest of friends have had to remain apart. We've read harrowing stories of relatives who couldn't even be at the bedsides of their loved ones in their dying hours. As Queen Elizabeth actually acknowledged in her address to the nation a few weeks ago, she said, Today, once again, many will feel a painful sense of separation from their loved ones. A painful sense of separation from their loved ones. She summed it up very well. Some psychologists are even warning about the spread of what they call separation anxiety disorder and predicting a major mental health crisis in the aftermath of this virus. Whether or not that is the case, you have probably experienced some degree of separation in these days and you felt it. You felt it. This evening I want to focus, however, on the worst separation of all. By far the worst kind of separation that anyone can experience. It's a separation referred to here in Ephesians 4 and verse 18, where we're told that unbelievers or non-Christians, those who do not know the Lord, we're told that they are separated from the life of God. Separated from the life of God. What a striking description that is of the condition of someone who is not a Christian. That they're separated from the life of God. If you're not a, a Christian, a true Christian this evening, whether you realize it or not, that is your situation. You are experiencing the worst kind of separation. Separation from God. And I want us to look this evening at four aspects of this worst separation. Four aspects. The first three won't be very positive, perhaps. They won't maybe be that pleasant to hear about. But let me assure you that the last one, the fourth one, does contain great news and good news that we all need to hear. Well, first of all, let's think about the awfulness of this separation. The awfulness of this separation. Some forms of separation are truly awful. Think, for example, and I know all about this because I've read a lot of 19th century Irish history. Think, of, uh, for example, of the separation caused by immigration in Ireland in the 19th century. They used to, to hold what they called American wakes for departing immigrants, treating them as if they were dead. For the, the, and these were occasions of great sorrow. There might have been a lot of alcohol, mind you, but they were occasions of great sorrow. For in all likelihood, the family at home would never ever again set their eyes on the one who was sailing away to that faraway land. So they held awake as if that person were dead. Think even of the sorrow the child experiences when a beloved pet dies. Even as adults, we can become so attached to a pet dog or a pet cat that we feel their loss very keenly. I'm not so fond of dogs nowadays because I got bitten by at least one. 
I'm not as fond as I used to be, but I remember, I remember as a boy many, many years ago, I still remember the pain caused by the loss of a pet, the loss of a pet dog. I remember bawling my eyes out, even though that was many years ago, I still remember it. Or think of the awful separation that occurs when the loving relationship between a husband and wife breaks down. Even if the spouse is totally innocent, he or she can feel the pain of that separation in a very deep manner. It can be almost unbearable at times. Or think of the, the agony of separation experienced when a loved one dies. Even though we may have the assurance that they have gone to a better place, how hard it is to know, how hard it is to part from them, how painful it is to be separated from them by the grave. So yes, there are many awful forms of separation in this fallen and hurting world in which we live. And all of us will experience the pain of separation in some form or other. You can be sure of that. However, this evening, this 18th verse of Ephesians chapter 4 speaks to us of the most awful form of separation. It speaks of being separated from the life of God. Some translations use the word alienated. And that also conveys the awfulness of being in this situation. If you're alienated from someone, you're not at peace with them. There's a problem in the relationship. There's a degree of separation and alienation. The same word is used in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, where it is said of the Ephesians, before they became Christians, that they had been separate from Christ, alienated from Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, and without hope and without God in the world. To be separated or alienated from God is to be without hope in the world. That's what it says. Take hold of that phrase. Without hope in the world. That surely speaks to us of how awful a thing it is to be separated from God. And notice how verse 18 speaks of being separated from the life of God. From the life of God. This tells us that non-Christians are spiritually dead. This tells us that the non-Christian has no spiritual life. If you're a non-Christian, you may indeed be full of physical life and energy. But how terrible to be utterly without spiritual life. How awful to have no meaningful relationship with the true and living God. How awful to have no prospect of eternal life when you die. Dear friend, I would say to you, if you're in this condition this evening, if you cannot say that God is real to you, if you cannot say that you have peace with him, if you cannot say that you know him, if you have not been reconciled to him, then you are, then you are in the most awful state of separation. And you need above all else to be rescued from it. And we'll see in a little while how that rescue can be brought about. But we need to be clear about why people are in such an awful state of separation from God. So having considered the awfulness of such separation, let's now look at the cause of the separation. The cause of the separation. The Bible makes it very, very clear that the cause of such separation from God is what it calls sin. Sin is the cause. And sin is human rebellion against God. Sin has been disobedient to God. Sin is wanting to do our own way. Go our own way and do our own thing. To show you that sin is that which causes this awful separation from God, let me take you to three different places or three different locations. Let me take you, first of all, to a garden. A garden long, long ago. The Garden of Eden, of course. And there we have Adam and Eve join perfect fellowship and friendship with Almighty God. But then, despite having all the other trees of the garden to feast upon, they refuse to obey God's command not to eat of the tree of good and evil. What happens to them as a result of that act? 
of disobedience. That's sin. Well, don't you read of them being cast out of the Garden of Eden, cut off from fellowship with God, separated from the enjoyment of his loving presence. Our first parents were excluded from that beautiful garden. They were shut out of paradise. That shows how sin is responsible for separating us from the life of God. For the sin of our first parents had profound and lasting consequences. The sin of Adam and Eve didn't just separate them from God. It has separated all of us who are the children of Adam from the one to whom we must give an account. Having brought you to the garden, let me now take you to the land of Israel in the time of the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 59 of Isaiah's prophecy, prophecy, which we read a little earlier, tells us that even though the people of Israel then were performing the outward, outward rituals of religion, they were not having their prayers answered. Why was that? Well, Isaiah tells us it, because, it was not because God had somehow lost the power to answer their prayers. It was not because God had come deaf to their prayers. No, it, it was because, as verse 2 declares, your iniquities, that's just a fancier word for sin, your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face so that he will not hear you. Once more, therefore, you can see that it is sin that brings about a separation from God. And by the way, here's a stark reminder to those of us who are outwardly religious that God will not hear us if we're allowing sin to dominate our lives. Having taken you to the garden, having taken you to the land of Israel, let me now take you to the heavenly court in order to reinforce the fact that it's sin that separates people from God. Look at Matthew chapter 15 sometime. There we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. And there we see the heavenly king and the judge pronouncing judgment on those who have been brought before him. And the king says to those who are portrayed as goats, he says to them these words, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What terrible words. What terrible, awful words addressed to those who have lived selfish, self-centered lives, who have not truly loved either God or his people. What terrible words we find addressed to them. Depart from me. Depart from me, he says. They are, they are ordered to depart from the presence of the king. Not only that, they are sent into eternal fire. Here, dear friends, we have the ultimate form of separation, an eternal separation from the presence of God. Much of the separation caused by this virus will come to an end sooner or later. But here's a separation that will never end. Don't you see, therefore, don't you see, therefore, why it is so, so vital to have your sins taken away, to have them forgiven? Don't you see, don't you see why it is so, so essential that you be reconciled to God? So far, we've looked at the awfulness of being separated from God. We've looked at the cause of being separated from God. Now, thirdly, the signs of this separation, the signs of the separation. Turn again to Ephesians 4 and verses 17 to 19. It identifies some other signs or characteristics of those who are separated from God. Look closely at the phrases. There are three such signs or marks. And the first one is this. Those who are separated from God have darkened minds. Darkened minds. They are darkened in their understanding. What does this mean? Well, this means, for example, that when such a person comes to read the Bible, and although the Bible is the living and true word of God, when they come to read the Bible, they can see little or nothing of value in it. If you like, the Bible is like a closed book to them. 
that is how you find the Bible to be. If you find the Bible to be like a closed book to you, just can't understand it or grasp it, it doesn't speak to you, then you need to call upon God to open the eyes of your understanding, to enlighten your mind by his Holy Spirit, to enable you to understand and believe the glorious truths of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second mark of those who are separated from God is that they have hardened hearts. Hardened hearts. Verse 18 speaks of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now the Greek word used here for hardening is a very striking word. It's used medically to refer to the, the callus that is formed when a bone has been fractured and reset. And such a callus is even harder than the bone itself. Don't we use the word callous to refer to somebody who's very insensitive and very cruel? We say that they're callous. Here it refers to the condition of the heart. Verse 18 speaks of the ignorance that is, due to, due, that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Hearts so hard that they're totally resistant to the, the great truths of the gospel. And as you read through the gospels, you see how hard the hearts even of the religious leaders were. Despite all their religion, they were so hardened by, by sin that they refused to believe in Jesus. In fact, so hardened were their hearts by sin that they were determined to kill Jesus, the true Savior and the true Messiah. Now, of course, you may not be so openly opposed to Jesus. But if you're coldly indifferent to him, if you have no real interest in him, no real desire for him, your heart is also in need of softening. If you have a hardened heart, the good news is that God can give you a new heart. A heart that can love him. A heart that can trust him. A heart that can believe in Jesus Christ as your saviour. Listen to what the Lord promises to do. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I remove from you your heart of stone. And give you a heart of flesh. Dear friend. God can do that for you. Even this evening. If you truly ask him to do it. He can take away your stony heart. And he can give to you a responsive. And believing heart. So we've seen two signs of those who are separated from God. They have darkened minds, they have hardened hearts. The third sign mentioned in verse 19 is immoral lives. Immoral lives. Very strong language is used here to describe the moral condition of those who are separated from the life of God. See how they have lost all sensitivity. Nothing shocks them. They have given themselves over to sensuality. They indulge in every kind of impurity. They have a continual lust for more. Now the Greek term used here is that having a determination to gratify oneself at all costs, regardless of the needs of others. All that matters is me, my desires, and the fulfillment of my desires. Now you may say to yourself, I'm not that morally corrupt. I'm a decent, respectable, upright, moral kind of person. Well, that may be true of you. It may be respectable. But in the sight of a holy God, none of us is morally pure. And every one of us has the capacity to de degenerate into these depths of depravity. But once again, there's good news. There's a way for us more and more to say no to moral corruption and impurity. And to live lives that are more pure and upright in the sight of God. For those who believe in Jesus Christ... Have the help of the Holy Spirit living in them to enable them to live in a much more morally upright manner. You see, here's a challenge for those of you listening this evening who profess to be Christians. We'll look back at what verse 17 insists upon. What it insists upon. It, it, it insists that genuine Christians must no longer live as the pagans do. Pagans being those who are separated from God. 
Let me then ask you, how different is your moral behaviour from those around about you who do not know God? Can it be said of you that, unlike them, you are very sensitive to the ugliness of immorality? Is it true of you that, unlike them, you resist every kind of impurity? Is it true of you that, unlike those who have a continual lust for morality, is it true of you that you have a continual longing to be more holy and more like the Lord Jesus Christ? May it be so. May you show that you are truly a Christian by more and more living a life that is so, so different from the immorality that marks our fallen society. And by living such a life, you'll not only honour God, by living such a life, you'll stand out from the crowd as you shine, as it were, like a star in the midst of a dark and corrupt generation. People will notice. People will notice. And God may use that even to turn their hearts toward the truth and toward the light. So the signs of being separated from God are darkened minds, hardened hearts, immoral living. If such things mark your life, if they show that you are still separate from the life of God, then you, dear friend, you urgently need, need to hear about the fourth thing that I want to mention this evening. You need to hear about the solution to this separation. The solution to this separation. There's no way that we can, by our own efforts, bridge the gap between our sin-spoiled lives and a holy God. No amount of religion can ever achieve that. No amount of charitable giving can ever achieve that. No amount of service to the community, no matter how admirable it may be, can ever achieve that. But the good news is that God has graciously provided a way by which helpless and separated sinners may be reconciled to him. Let me explain the solution to you. Having earlier taken you to the garden, and to the land of Israel, and to the heavenly court, let me now take you, as it were, to the cross that once stood on a hillside on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. And let me point you to the one, as it were, who was nailed to that cross, the one who died on that cross, the one who, as Isaiah puts it, the one who was cut off from the land of the living, separated from the land of the living, the one who died on that cross to take away the sins of all who will believe on him, the one who not only died on that, on that cross, but also the one who was willing to endure for a time an awful sense of separation from the love of his heavenly Father as he paid the penalty for the sins of his people. Listen to the terrible sense of separation that Jesus Christ endured on that cross. Listen to how he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This has been called the most terrible cry in all of history. That awful sense of separation experienced by Jesus, the one who had always enjoyed perfect fellowship and friendship with the Father. But herein lies the solution for separated sinners. Herein is the way for you to be reconciled to God. You need to repent of your sins, confess them to God, and put your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Then your sins will be taken away. You'll be reconciled to God. The separation will be at an end. If your sins are still separating you from God, I would beseech you, I would urge you, I would earnestly urge you, be reconciled to God this very evening. Dear friend, when a sinner does put their faith in Jesus, when that barrier caused by sin has been taken away, he or she can be absolutely sure that they will never ever be separated from God. You can be sure that nothing at all, nothing in the past and nothing in the future, nothing in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, the Saviour. To conclude then, let us then be convinced 
that while there are many awful forms of separation in our world, by far the worst form of separation is to be separated from the life of God. Let us be clear then that sin is the cause of that awful separation. Let us then be aware that such sin is linked to darkness of mind, to hardness of heart and immoral living. But let us then be assured that Jesus Christ can reconcile even those who seem to be farthest away from God and bring them into the enjoyment of eternal life. How wonderful to know that he who has the Son of God has life. And dear believer, would you then rejoice this evening that in and through Jesus Christ you have been reconciled to God. Separation has been brought to an end. That though you were once separated from the life of God, you now have eternal life. And of nothing whatsoever, not this dreaded coronavirus, which has brought about so much separation, not even this dreadful virus can ever, ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. No longer separated from the life of God, but in him having eternal life. Praise be to his name. Amen. We close by singing praise to the Lord in Psalm 45 and the closing verses. Here's a picture of the bride, which represents believers, the church of Jesus Christ, being brought into the palace of the glorious King, where there is rejoicing and there is joy, not kept outside, not sent away, but brought into the very palace of the great King with joy and rejoicing. So let's sing this song of praise with joy and rejoicing in our hearts, knowing that what a friend we have in Jesus, how he has brought us near to the Lord God. Let us sing praise to the Lord's name. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
be with you all this evening and forevermore. Amen.